Did you know dry eye is the most common disease seen by eye care professionals worldwide? I'm quite certain some of you actually suffer from dry eye. The purpose of this presentation is to provide a better understanding of dry eye and ocular surface disease. I'm Jennifer Branning. I'm an optometrist. I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry and a member of the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Disease Society, as well as the Ocular Surface Society of Optometry. And I'm the owner of the Dry Eye Center of West Michigan. Tonight we'll be talking about dry eye, computer and device use, which I'm sure many of you are involved in on a daily basis. And we're also going to talk a little bit about some makeup tips that can help people with dry eye. And don't worry if you don't wear makeup. We also talk about some lid hygiene tips and maybe you can take some tips for makeup use back to a friend or loved one who does use makeup. So in simple terms, dry eye is a chronic progressive disease that can have a negative effect on our quality of life. And it really does make people miserable. And to me, that's part of the joy I get out of practicing in a dry eye setting. So we can really help people. So some of the symptoms of dry eye, many of you are probably aware of. Watering eyes, which is always baffling to people. They, How could I have a dry eye if it's watery? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Problems wearing contact lenses, very common. Many patients quit wearing contacts because they're so miserable they can't stand the feeling of them in their eyes. Light sensitivity, blurry vision, or fluctuating vision, that's another real common issue that patients with dry eye have. And dry, just itchy, burny eyes. So this is what's called a speed questionnaire. We use this when we have patients who come into our office and we suspect that possibly some of their symptoms are related to dry eye. You may not be able to see it, not sure if I can blow it up. I don't think I can, but basically it's quick. It just takes a few minutes to, to fill out and it, we, it gives us a numerical score that guides us in whether we need to do further dry eye testing or not. And it asks things like how often are your eyes dry or gritty or are they sore, or watery? And then it goes on to ask the severity of those particular symptoms. So that's very helpful. If patient scores higher than six on this, then we know ah, we probably need to do a little further investigating. So there are many dry eye mimickers. Oftentimes we get patients who come in with symptoms and they'll say, you know, it's probably my allergies. And it's nice that we can do some things to really sort out what the problem is. Demodex is very common. It's a mite that lives on our skin, which is very disgusting. Everybody thinks, ah, but we have mites on our skin and sometimes they take over, as like our teenagers in the house and many other things you can see here that can mimic. So it's important to sort out the root of the problem and what the symptoms are from it. Is it really dry eye or is it something else? So many specialized diagnostic tests for dry eyes that I think most patients aren't even aware of. So one of the things that I like to use a lot is called tear lab osmolarity. We have an examination tool called the keratograph. We'll go into all these things in just a minute. Inflammatory testing, looking at meibomian glands, the list goes on. So tear lab osmolarity, I see as one of the most critical things. It's almost like blood work when you're trying to determine if someone's diabetic. We don't look at a patient and say, oh, you have diabetic symptoms, you must be diabetic and start to treat them. We do blood tests and that's what tear lab does for us. It takes a little, just a little tiny sample of tears. It's painless, it takes just a moment and we can measure the salt content of the tear. And that's really, like I said, the best indicator of whether a patient is suffering from dry eye or not. We use then the keratograph, which is probably one of my favorite instruments. I really love it. It gives us great views, does a lot of things that we can put together a report for a patient and tell them what's happening with the surface of their eye. The dry eye report looks like this. And the red is obviously not good, like red in anything. Red, red means you're very symptomatic, have some issues. Green is, that's in the good zone. So it'll tell us how we can video how frequently a person is blinking. Is their blink pattern normal? Or have they kind of lapsed into the, I'm looking at a computer staring where they don't blink at all. That can be a major issue for a patient. We can scan the meibomian glands. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that in just a minute. And we can measure how many tears they actually have in their eye. Do they have enough or, or not enough? There is another questionnaire built into this. We can take a video of the front of their eye, many, many things, and then present this report, and it helps us make a treatment plan. 
we use Inflamadry testing. It's real simple. It's like a quick strep test. It takes about 10 minutes to cook and then we can read it. I kind of chuckle and tell patients we have a lot of fun with this because it looks a little bit like a pregnancy test. A little red line shows up and so we especially get chuckles with male patients and most people find it kind of humorous. But it's very helpful. It tells us are there a very specific type of inflammatory cell in the tear film and it guides our treatment plan. Types of dry eye. 90% of the population has plenty of tears. They're just poor quality. So they have what we call evaporative dry eye. A small percentage simply don't have enough tears. And those are typically patients who have arthritis and things like that that affect their immune system. So as promised, this is a just kind of a schematic, one of my favorite things I share with patients that discusses the meibomian glands. And the, the meibomian glands are these little long white tubes. They're sebaceous glands, just like on your skin. And it makes sense when you think about it. Oh, they're on my eyelid. Yeah, my eyelid's part of my skin. And you can see over time they start to shorten. And then they do what's called truncating. And then we actually start to lose glands. I never like to see this, but I do see this. So this is a schematic. This is actually a real eyelid. So this gives us a really good idea of what's going on with this person's meibomian glands. Is this the root of the problem? Excessive device use has really led to a big increase in meibomian gland dysfunction because we don't blink normally when we are looking at a screen. And that's why I brought this picture up. It's really an issue. And, and, and then we say, well, we're going to be looking at screens for the rest of our lives. What do we do about this problem? So one of the biggest things that we look at is lid hygiene, super simple. And uh, many of us avoid the soap around our eyes because it stings. And I don't blame you, I do the same thing. I'm a big fan of Norwex. Now, I do not sell Norwex, just so you know, but those are chemical free. They're cloths, people do sell them. They kind of like Tupperware or something, but that's a wonderful product. It's not disposable, so you can reuse it. So it's cost effective for people. Not always a big fan of baby shampoo, especially in the past. There were fragrance and nasty things in baby shampoo, actually. But now we can get natural, so that's better. We have a lot of other lid hygiene products that we do recommend to patients, some of which we carry here in our office. But these give you some examples, just real quickly, of some of the things that we can do to help people. So next is a little, just a schematic of some of the additional dry treatments. I love to show this because everyone knows about what we call artificial tears. And I'm not a big fan of those. I always say, we did not come into this world with tears strapped to our hip. We really should not have to use those. There are situations where people absolutely do, but in most cases, we can avoid the constant excessive use of these artificial tears by doing other things. Lid hygiene, simply removing eye makeup and cleaning the lids at night before we go to bed, just like we brush our teeth. Uh, other things too, like lipoflow treatments. Sometimes if patients don't have enough tears, we do put a plug in to keep more tears up, but we don't do that very often anymore. There are prescription medications, Restasis, Zydra. Uh, Jennifer Anderson is the spokesperson for Zydra. You may know that it's called I Love are the commercials. We don't see them so much anymore, but we did a couple years ago. Those are great options too. So lots of things we can do to help people is the point of this little slide here. Why not use artificial tears? Well, like I said earlier, we didn't come into the world that way. Most people have plenty of tears. They don't get to the root of the problem. It's sort of like if you've got a fire in your kitchen and you're just spraying the hose on it, but you never remove the source of the fire. We don't want meibomian glands to get worse. Putting tears in just masks the initial, or not the initial problem, the root of the problem. And so the, the meibomian glands will just continue to get worse. And, and that's not a good thing. We need our meibomian glands. So some of the things that worsen dry, we mentioned autoimmune diseases, medications, antihistamines are terrible, Benadryl is one of the worst, uh, antidepressants, things like that can, can make dry eyes worse, device use, as we mentioned, incomplete closure of the eyelid. We give out sleep masks all the time, and about 30% of the population has incomplete eyelid closure. Super simple thing to really improve a person's comfort. Uh, fans in the home and poor hydration or other things, thyroid disorders, many, many things. And these are some tips about your device use. We always say, follow the 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes, look up from your device, focus your eyes on something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Train yourself to blink properly. 
There's actually a Donald Corp Blink training app. It's a free app on Apple devices. If you want information about that, I do have my email listed at the end of this presentation. I'd be happy to pass that on to you. Invest in a pair of glasses that's designed specifically for computer use. A good quality pair. Don't buy something on Amazon that you don't really know if it's even doing what it says it'll do. Humidify the air in your workspace. Close the vents over your devices. They may be blowing on you and you don't even know it. We tell people, hold a Kleenex in front of you if you don't think a fan is, is blowing air around and watch what it does. That's a real good indicator. Blink exercises. This gives you a quick close, pause, pause, open, relax. You want your eyelids to close, touch completely. You don't need to squeeze them like that, but just lightly close them. And even once you're aware that you're not blinking properly, it's amazing that you can sort of remind yourself, oh, I need to blink and let my eyelids close. That's what draws the oil out of those glands. And there's the Donald Core Blink Training app again. And like I said, I'll be happy to share that in the future if you need it. Makeup tips, avoid makeup remover pads. They're full of alcohol that dries this tissue around your eyes. Avoid waterproof makeup. Replace your mascara every three months. Don't put eyeliner behind the lashes on the edge of the lid. Remove your makeup every single night and absolutely stay away from lash extensions. I don't even want to go into those. That's an entire new separate lecture. And then, you know, as far as products go, how can you tell what are the good products? Expensive doesn't mean good. Many of the best things are not expensive, like baby oil, argan oil. Learn to read labels. I do have a list of ingredients to avoid. So again, at the end, I have my email. I'll share that with you. Limit the number of products you use. Coconut oil, argan oil, as mentioned before, great natural products. And there are other things you can use for thicker lashes and use some natural lash conditioners, that sort of thing. So what are you doing to make ocular surface disease worse? One of the things you can do is take a look in your medicine cabinet. Avoid and analyze sodium lower sulfate. This is a great list. And again, I have this available if you'd like it. So now you have a better understanding of dry eye and ocular surface disease. And don't forget, you opened two gifts this morning. They were your eyes. Treat them like the gift they are. And here's my email address. If you would like any of the information that I presented, I'm more than happy to share it with you. Thanks for listening in.